Um, I know it's it's insane, right? Mm-hmm. It's scary in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, I have some young buyers that you know they're, they're just getting priced out. <laughs> like they got to right. hope that things come down a bit. And that they haven't they haven't seen the housing market corrections of like the early '80s and think real estate can only go up. It's like hey, guys. <laughs> anyway, hey, what happened? How did track announcers notebook turn into a real estate seminar? The prices <laughs> of houses in Hamilton. <laughs> well, well, you know what? Jordan's a financial guy, so we could actually do right. a whole seminar. Okay, we can do another thing. show. Right. Yeah. That'll be a different show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My wife said to me, how is a respectable financial advisor with Manulife get into road racing? Well, we'll have you answer that question a little bit later on, Jordan. Okay. Okay. And I'll just get going here in a yeah. minute. Stuart and I can save the finance talk for another, another time. Right, that's yeah, a we'll different do seminar. Session. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Monday, March 29th edition of uh, Track Announcers Notebook. Uh, Pat Gonzalez and Stuart Nodell, and we've got Jordan as our special guest, not Zolk, but Roids. You'll be learning a lot more about this rookie pro rider who had a great uh, 2020 racing in the Super Series and SOAR winning all kinds of races and, uh, and championships. But uh, first up, Stuart, uh, today was certainly a sad day in the world of uh, motorcycling here in Canada and motorcycle racing. It sure was, Pat. And uh, I'm sorry to have to share the news. I know Chris is a good personal friend of yours. He's obviously uh, very well known in the motorcycle industry. So we have a, a little music I'm going to play here. And um, I'll read through this, uh, these very nice words that uh, you put together for me. So, uh, we have lost a giant in the Canadian motorcycle industry. Chris Ellis passed away earlier today after a brief illness. Chris was an avid motorcyclist and a racer and worked in the motorcycle industry at the dealership and manufacturer level most recently as the head of Triumph Motorcycles in Canada before retiring last year. We extend our condolences to Chris's wife, Christine, his family, and hundreds of friends in the motorcycle racing community that knew Chris. Chris's unwavering passion and love for motorcycling and the people, it was second to none. We are all richer for having known Chris Ellis. Thank you, uh, Stuart. And um, yeah, we are uh, tearing up a little bit. Um, Chris was uh, one of the good ones. And I know there are uh, a number of uh, people uh, on the uh, webcast tonight who are also very, very good friends uh, with Chris. But uh, uh, Chris was one of those, uh, the show must go on kind of guys. And um I'm sure he uh, he would want to hear from uh, a budding rookie pro rider who's going to be racing CSBK Superbike. And we'll get to our conversation with Jordan Royds here in a little bit. But uh, first up, Stuart, as always, we've got uh, Nodell's notes. Yeah, Pat. And uh, this weekend, it was a it was the kickoff to MotoGP. So uh, Maverick Vinales was the big winner this past weekend. But there was a ton of storylines in the uh, the premier class. We had the Ducatis reach uh, 360 kilometers an hour. And for our American friends, that's about 225 miles an hour. So uh, it was expected the Ducatis were going to dominate. But what was interesting through the race, as much as they were a threat for the wind, I guess with the, the kind of horsepower output they were consuming, they just didn't have the fuel mileage. So they had to switch to uh, different maps uh, throughout the race. Um, to restrict the use of fuel and uh, obviously that horsepower advantage went away beyond about you know the halfway point in the, in the race so uh, it was a good race overall and um, I'll just go through some of the results here quickly uh, Joanne Mir finished fourth but uh, he climbed up all the way from qualifying back in uh, the 10th position which wasn't a great qualifying effort for him but he was up to p2 on the lap on the last lap and in the last corner he got in there a bit hot and then the two uh, Ducatis of Johan Zarco and uh, 
Becca Bagnaya passed him for those podium spots. So I think the class looks to be uh, exciting again this year. Post competition, they were setting lap records all throughout the weekend. But I think uh, Maverick Vinales is going to have to, you know, he's he's won before and he's shown that he could be a, a class favorite. But I, I don't know if people believe it yet because we, we've seen this before from him. So hopefully um, he can find that consistency and be a real threat for the championship. Uh, indeed, I think uh, we're in for uh, quite a, a championship battle this year. Um, of course, uh, Mark Marquez, I'm um, not sure when he's going to return to the series, but um, we hope to have Yuji Kikuchi on a uh, future show here just to talk a little bit uh, about MotoGP after the first few rounds to sort of recap the early part of the championship and uh, still waiting to see if the Event scheduled for uh, Circuit of the Americas on April the 18th uh, is, in fact, going to get rescheduled for the fall. And uh, I think you can be hopeful, looking at the way the vaccine is going out in the United States, that they might be able to reschedule that event. We will see. Yeah, that'd be great. I, I think, uh, like you're saying, Pat, and, and even in the other classes, the uh, the support races, Moto2 was... Uh, a pretty good race, although Sam Lowe's really owned the weekend. He qualified on pole, took a pretty commanding lead into the race and was really, you know, uncontested, but uh, he looked really good. But uh, Remy Gardner and Raul Fernandez, uh, the two Red Bull KTM riders, um, they looked awesome. And Raul Fernandez is one of the, he's running for that rookie uh, award in the Moto2 class last year, going against, you know, likes of Cameron Bobier. And there's a bunch of really young, talented guys in the class coming up the ranks. And uh, having said that, Cameron Bobier qualified 22nd and did make his way up all the way to the 11th position. So we did have a points paying position. He had a lot of, they, you know, they showed some uh, footage of him racing and fighting for positions. He was riding really aggressively. So hopefully, you know, he's finding the kind of confidence he's going to need to get to the, uh, the, the front runners in the class. But Moto2 has uh, got a lot of talented guys in it. So he's got his hands full for sure. Yeah, and Bobier's problem, of course, he's learning these racetracks for the first time and learning this Moto2 bike compared to the super bikes he's been racing in Moto America. So I think we'll see much better uh, finishes and performances from uh, from Cameron Bobier as the, the season goes along. But uh, a good kickoff to the uh, to the championship. For sure. And also a shout out to American Joe Roberts, not all about Cam Bobier, but uh, Joe Roberts finished uh, sixth, he qualified fifth. So that was a good start to his season and he's expected to be a championship contender. So uh, good result for him. And then in the Moto3 class, it was all about uh, Joam uh, Masia and uh, actually in Darren Bender, he was uh, very competitive. That's uh, Brad Bender's younger brother, the South African riders. And um, like any Moto3 race, this is my favorite class personally to watch. You could have covered the top 14 guys with a blanket, Pat. They were all so close and <laughs> nobody wanted to really lead coming out of the kilometer long front straightaway. But uh, Joao Masia, he uh, he took the lead on the last lap and he held up all challengers, including Darren Bender, who did finish third. Okay, so great start to uh, MotoGP, Moto3. Joe Rocket can Go ahead, Sorry, Stuart. Pat, that was me. I'll run the Joe Rocket ad here for us. Okay. Joe Rocket Canada is the official motorcycle gear for the Canadian National Superbike Championship. With over 40 global racing championships, Joe Rocket Canada has sponsored some of the greatest racers, including the Hayden brothers, Miguel Duhamel, Steve Crevier, and Pascal Picot. Reigning and 14-time Canadian Superbike champion Jordan Zoke will ride Rocket in 2021 in his fight for 15. Joe Rocket Canada produces a wide range of motorcycle and snowmobile gear, including jackets, pants, helmets, gloves, and footwear. This riding and racing season, Champions Ride Rocket, the official motorcycle gear of CSBK. Which brings us to our featured guest tonight, Pat. I'll let you take it away with uh, Jordan. And uh, Jordan will be racing in uh, CSBK this year as a rookie pro rider while well, uh jordan roids uh they will hopefully be talking about two jordans in the csb uh bk series uh welcome to uh track announcers notebook i know we had you on at the end of last year uh, when the sore season wrapped up um how much 
of the success that you had in 2020 racing an amateur superbike at both the SOAR and the Shannonville Super Series. Uh, how much confidence does that uh, give you going into your rookie pro season in CSBK? Well, hi, Pat. Hi, Stuart. Thanks for having me again. Um, it's really hard to say. I definitely did had a lot of success last year. Uh, it's, it's kind of hard to translate how my finishes in amateur relate to the finishes in pro, even at tracks like Mossport, where we were all running the same track uh, with the new pavement and just a, a lesser field than other years. And it, it looks like a lesser field than 2021. As far as just the sheer number of guys, it's it's kind of hard to compare. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the success did give me a fair amount of confidence going into the year. And uh, the bike setups just continued to improve. My riding continued to improve. And uh, I'm hoping to keep that momentum going forward, really just focusing on, on myself and my own riding. Well, you're going to be running, I would think, at some uh, new racetracks in CSBK. You, of course, got lots of experience at Grand Band Motorplex. Uh, there's no round at CSBK. Uh, at Shannonville, and of course, uh, you've got experience at uh, Canadian Tire Motorsport Park. Uh, have you done uh, any on-track sessions at Calabogie or Atlantic Motorsport Park? So Calabogie, when I found out they were running the National there last year, I showed up, uh, I think, two weeks before to run my first laps there in preparation for the National. So I did that, and then uh, I did run the National there as well. I was actually able to break the, the fastest amateur lap there from 2015, the last time they ran it. So that was good. Um, still watching the footage, there's lots of room for improvement there, as well as at Mossport, where, again, it was my first time racing. I had been there twice uh, in previous years, 2015 and 17, I think, on a, a street bike. Uh, but Shubenacadie is 100% brand new to me. I'm not really sure how that's going to work out. I think I'm going to try and find uh, some onboard footage and try and study as much as I can in the same way I did with uh, Calabogie to learn it. Um, as far as where the, where the track goes, the turning points, the braking markers, uh, so on and so forth. But that, that'll be the biggest challenge, I think, going forward this year. Learning those, uh, those racetracks. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, last year, you primarily uh, ran Grand Bend and, uh, and Shannonville with the new Pro 6 uh, GP series. In addition to CSBK, what of the regional series are you looking at, uh, at running and, and how were you able to put that schedule together? Right. So my focus so far this year has been 100% on CSBK, uh, just lining up everything that I need to, to hit every one of those rounds. And then the uh, regional leading up to each CSBK round was my plan. Now, Grand Bend, there is still the regional before the CSBK national. However, for Calabogie, the regional is now converted to the pro superbike double header for CSBK. So I don't have a uh, regional to warm up at, if you will, in advance of the national. So as far as now, the five national rounds plus SOAR round one are my definitive plans for racing. And then whether I do some pro, uh, uh, pro six regionals at Calabogie or some other SOAR rounds is yet to be determined. It'll, I'm just going to play it by ear, really, see how, how the season goes. Now, last year, you were working closely with uh, long time uh, team manager, uh, motorcycle mechanic. He wears lots of different hats. Uh, ben Gardner, are you back with him for the uh, for the CSBK rookie pro season? Definitely. Um, that was one of the things I locked down in, I think it was still October. Um, I wanted to get Ben on board and, and get working with Ben. Like you said, it's, it's hard to put a title on what he is and what he brings to the program, but basically everything from crew chief, mechanic, uh, suspension tuner. Uh, I think we all know he's a Dunlop tire expert. So tires as well as uh, being a riding coach. So he kind of brings a, a wealth of knowledge and experience 
to the table. Uh, we've worked together in varying degrees the past two years. And more often than not, he's told me to do something. And then after not doing it three times, then I realize, oh, why didn't I just listen to Ben? So this year I'm going to try and, uh, and listen more. And I'm, I just couldn't be more excited to have him in my corner and, and working with him towards uh, improving. Well, my co-host Stuart Nodell worked with uh, Ben for a lot of years. Stuart, did you listen to Ben? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Pat. I, I had to because there's just, it's Ben's way or the highway. So, and, and truthfully, I have to say, I mean, I was a guy before I raced with Ben, I was fortunate to race with uh, some other good people beforehand, but um, he does really have your best interest at heart and he does have a lot of experience. So you just, you know, he's watching what you're doing on the track and it's hard as a rider to sometimes take yourself out of that equation. But uh, yeah, I was, I was really fortunate, Ben, uh, he, he really taught me how to become a good racer. I was, I was generally a decent rider, but I just didn't have a lot of race craft. And uh, he made all the difference in, in my racing. So that'll be enough. I'll, I'll let you guys continue. But uh, I'm sure yeah. if Ben's listening out there, he'll be feeling pretty good about himself. <laughs> well, yeah, I try and um, not let his head get too big. But, but really, I can't uh, emphasize enough how much he did bring to the table last year. And uh and how excited I am to do at least all of the nationals uh, with him there. I think we're kind of committed to that. And then the SOAR regional, uh, I believe he's there doing the Dunlop tire service. So I'll be able to at least pick his brain, even if he is primarily focusing on uh, providing the Dunlop service. Again, if you're uh, with us tonight on Track Announcers Notebook, uh, make use of the Q&A here on our uh, Zoom platform if you've got a question, a comment for, uh, for Jordan Royds. And if you have uh, joined us late uh, off the top of the show, uh, sad news about the passing of Chris Ellis. I know there are a number of people on the broadcast uh, tonight that uh, were very, very good friends of his. If you've got uh, a comment or a little tribute you'd like to uh, put in there. We'll uh, get to it a little bit uh, later on. Uh, uh, Stuart, in fact, let's go to the Q&A because I think uh, our good uh, announcing colleague, Eric Tritko, is uh, with us tonight and uh, he had a question. Yes, he does, Pat. Thanks. Eric's asking, and I don't know if it's for me or for Jordan, but we'll let Jordan go first. What is the lesson from Ben it took you the longest to take to heart? Um... Hmm. Uh, I guess it's, it's really just, uh, to, to ride by feel and not, um, not try and listen to what other people are saying or, or data and just kind of, uh, think of what the bike is, is doing and, and how you're feeling on it, as opposed to paying attention to all this other noise. Um, it's kind of, I would say the, the old school approach, if you will. And being younger and, and pretty good with technology, I try and uh, do things in that direction. So with Ben having the old school approach, if you will, and me having a more minor input with uh, trying to use some technology, um, I think we're working well together, but it's, it's been hard for me to, to listen to that other side. So I, I continue to work on that and uh, I'm, I'm excited to do so this season. Stuart, what about you? What was that lesson that it took uh, Ben Gardner a number of races to hammer through your thick skull? <laughs> well, it was prob probably uh, along the line, not so much for, I wasn't very technically, or I'm still not technically savvy about the bikes at all. So there was never that conversation about me thinking I knew how to tune the bikes. It was more focusing on what I did or didn't need. And a great example was one of our first races he couldn't attend and he just sent me to Shannonville with no spare parts some spare wheels to change tires that's it no sprockets no jetting no anything and uh, I was kind of freaked out because you're used to bringing you know boxes and boxes of spare parts and he's like I've been racing here since the 80s I know like there's only three settings on these bikes or whatever it was pretty basic and I went out and I, I dominated the race and uh, it was a pretty funny kind of story to go through but in the end, uh, in the final heat race, I, or sorry, the final event, I, uh, I did crash out front well in the lead, but it had nothing to do 
with anything other than me just making a rider's error. But uh, no, he taught me very early on again, just to, just to worry about racing on the racetrack. Cause that's a big enough, that's a hard enough job as it is. And a lot of riders underestimate that, you know, don't waste energy, um, working on the bike. Like I would just nap all day before I race. Like that's what I did. So, uh, I just learned that early on, just listen to what he said and things seem to work out. So I have no complaints. Jordan, the, uh, the bikes that you rode last year as, uh, as an amateur rider, are you back on the same equipment or are there upgrades or is there a new, uh, super bike that you're going to be debuting and what does the, uh, the color scheme and sponsorship logos we're going to see on the bike right so um last year i started the season on the yamaha and then finished it on the bmw uh essentially so the same bmw that i had is going to be my race bike it's um it's basically all prepared all i've done is is pull the bodywork off and send it for paint uh i'm debating on whether or not to get some more advanced data analytic tools on it um, like suspension potentiometers and, and whatnot. Other than that, it's basically ready to race uh, as soon as I get the bodywork back from paint. And as far as a B bike, um, still sort of figuring that out. I have the A bike down and, and know what's going on with it and I'm comfortable with it. So uh, I'm happy about that. And then in the coming six to eight weeks, I should get the B bike situation figured out. Uh, the paint scheme is going to be similar to the Yamaha. So uh, red, uh, pretty much all red with a black uh, belly pan and black front fender. Um, the sponsorships, uh, the main title sponsor it will be IBW Canada, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers who have sponsored me in the past and sponsored the series in the past. So I couldn't really be happier and, and prouder to be affiliated with that organization as a electrician myself and an IBEW member. Um, it, it's nice to see them step up and support one of their own. Coincidentally, I met Tom Reed at the national that IBEW sponsored in 2018. I found out about two weeks before the national that IBEW was sponsoring it and, and reached out through my union to say, you know, hey, I'm, did you guys know I'm racing it? Is this just a, a coincidence? And uh, it was. And then uh, we've talked ever since. And uh, he has a passion for motorcycles. Sorry, Tom Reed being the, the vice president of IBW uh, Canada. And uh, as do I, and he wanted to support the sport and, and support me. So it's going to be a lot of IBW logos on the bike. Um, and then as far as other sponsors, I'm uh, just kind of finalizing some of those. So BMW is obviously a big part of that. Um, ben Gartner, I'm sure there will be a Pro Star Motorsport sticker on there somewhere. And uh, Alpha Racing actually just came on board this week. Hindle Exhausts and Woodcraft came on board this week as well. Um, so they're providing me support as well as uh, Plus Racing Gear is making me a custom leather suit to fit my existing airbags. So really excited about those. Uh, KW Sport Racing Canada and, uh, and John Bickle, of course. Those are, those are the main sponsors that'll be on there as far as uh, the shape and the final placement of everything. That's uh, one of the last pieces of the puzzle I'm working on right now. So Imagine. I'm so yeah. I'm actually drafting a, a press release and in the process of getting something to call in at CSBK to, to uh, publish. I'm just not really sure if I can wait till I get a picture of the bike or uh, the exact timeline of when it's going to be ready. Okay. So you're, uh, you're well on your way to getting to that, uh, that opening round at uh, Calabogie in early uh, June. And before that, of course, the, uh, the Source Series kicks off uh, at Grand Bend, where uh, they'll be racing on the uh, second weekend of, uh, of June. Um, in terms of the backup bike, are you uh, in the process of getting another BMW, I would, I would think? And where's that going to come from? Uh, that's the plan. Uh, I'm not sure yet. Um, there's a few things up in the air. And um, I... 
I can't say at the moment. Uh, I'm looking to figure that out in the next month. But yeah, that's the plan to be uh, on another, to have another BMW there for the rain, um, just just in case. Speaking but, of the rain, I was at that final sore round in early October uh, where they had lots of rain. And I think you elected to sit out the final uh, amateur uh, super bike race. Um, do you like running in the rain or would you rather not at all put on those uh, Dunlop rain tires? Oh, I'm, I'd be happy if it rained every round. <laughs> um, so far, my record in the rain is, is pretty good. I won my first national at Mossboard in the rain. And that was my first time on rain tires and my first time running in the rain. So uh, it went really well. Then at SOAR the last round when we met, I, uh, I did actually win my amateur superbike race. Um, that one, I, I wrapped up the title with that race. And then I went on to win the open sprint race as well in the rain. Um, that was probably one of my best races to date. One of the most memorable, just the challenges of, of the rain and the weather all weekend. And unfortunately, the last race I went out in was the Pro Superbike Invitational. Invitational, And uh, I only made it through most of the way through turn one. And uh, I was just a little too aggressive, lost the rear and high sided. And my R1 went uh, sliding down the road with me. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, your goals for, uh, for 2021 as a rookie, uh, where do you think you can realistically run uh, you know, cause you're up against a, a lot of seasoned riders. Now we've got, uh, a number of other riders coming in, including Alex Dumas, who's going to be there on the Suzuki. Ben Young is back. Uh, what, what are your goals for the season? Have you talked to Ben about those? Um, a little bit. Uh, they've changed actually since November, October, November, really. Um, back then, I think, uh, like I basically, I was expecting or, or hoping for top tens and with the main goal being to make it to every round, uh, and be consistent, finish every race. That was, that was my goal. But as I continue to hear rumors and see press releases about more riders, more and more riders coming into the series, that goal is looking more and more challenging. So um, that's maybe becoming an optimistic goal as far as, you know, top 10s. Uh, top 15s, I think, are is more realistic. But really, I'm trying not to focus too much on the, the places and just focus on my own riding because I, I can't really control what everybody else is doing as long as I put myself in good positions and try and avoid mistakes. That's, uh, that's the main goal. Yeah, now you came to road racing uh, fairly late uh, before we went on at eight o'clock. We were, we were chatting about this. Uh, there was no real motorcyclists in your immediate family. So you're sort of a late bloomer getting into the amateur road racing and then uh, on into the, the pros uh, this year. Um, take us through the, uh, the evolution of uh, going through those uh, early years in motorcycling to end up road racing. Right. So um, I guess it all started, I was 18 and uh, a good friend of mine who I worked with uh, every day, basically when I was an apprentice, an electrician, he was my journeyman said one day, uh, Hey Jordan, uh, get a dirt bike. And I thought, okay, I'd been on an ATV once in Dominican Republic when I was 14 and it was fun. So I thought, what the heck, uh, picked up a dirt bike and he picked up a dirt bike and we started riding. Uh, it was a, a slow start to it. Um, and just as I got faster, moved from dirt bike to dirt bike, I did a couple hair scrambles in my early twenties, I guess. Um, never really got into it. I think I did four or five and, uh, then as I was kind of getting out of dirt biking or out of uh, dirt bike racing, I got uh, started getting street bikes 
and uh, moved up and up doing them all while still dirt biking for fun. And then at a certain point, I, I ended up getting an R1. So that would have been 2015. And I thought, okay, I better get some leathers to protect myself and proper gear for riding this thing on the street. Once I had the gear, then I thought, well, I better try this thing on the racetrack. It's where it was meant to be and made for. And basically when I did my first track day in uh, August, I think of that year. It where was, was that? Uh, where was the track day? Uh, Toronto Motorsports Park. Okay. So it was with uh, the guys with bikes, the intro to track school. And uh, from that point, I was like, okay, well, I've got a new hobby now. Um, I knew it was going to be, I was going to be spending a lot of time on the track and really, really enjoyed riding it. And uh, that eventually just got faster and faster at track days, sort of compared my times to the racers eventually once I ran uh, like Mossport, then did uh, Michelle Mercier's fast school. Okay. And uh, eventually it was kind of time to, okay, let's prep my bike for racing and, and try, try my hand at that. So uh, the first round I went to was in 2018, the second last round of the year running uh, Shannonville's Pro Track. And uh, I was actually able to win my first race in amateur superbike on my R1. And uh, then again, like even just showing up to the weekend, I knew pretty well I'd, I'd wanted to do this. And uh, the feeling you get, the thrill, the excitement is... Uh, it's difficult to compare to, to other things. So, um, yeah, I basically haven't looked back since then. I had a little bit of a, a rough year in 2019 with injuries and inconsistency and crashing. And, uh, and then 2020, I really, uh, put things together. And what was, what was the big difference between, uh, 2019 with all those crashes and DNFs and then, uh, having as strong a year as you did last year, winning all of those uh, races at both uh, SOAR and at the Super Series and, and at uh, Canadian Tire Motorsport Park. Right. Um, Did the so, light bulb go on? Uh, a, a fair number of them, actually. It was a handful of factors. I'm just trying to think of the, the main ones. So one of the big ones was uh, October of 2019. I... Uh, I went across to Europe to watch motocross of nations in Holland. And in planning that trip, uh, I had seen ads for Leod escapes who runs motorcycle tours with track time in at MotoGP tracks. So I connected with Kat from Leod escapes and uh, he booked me in with uh, Troy Corser's school in racing school Europe. And I was able to get over there and do his school at Catalonia and uh, it was just an amazing experience that really taught me a lot of fundamentals that I haven't gotten from anywhere else. And, uh, my two instructors there, I got to give them a shout out, Jim and Nico, they were amazing. Um, a lot of the stuff I had, I had picked up some bad habits, so I was resistant to try what they were telling me eventually when I did, then things really started clicking. And I mean, just the ability to, to, meet with Troy, talk to him after the riding. Um, you know, we were having a few cold beverages after riding. It's not every day you get to do that with a world champion and uh, pick his brain. So that would be a big part of it. Um, and then, I mean, three days on circuit on Catalonia on a brand new S1000 double R that didn't hurt things either. Um, so that would be part A. Part B was some of the setup things that I had. Uh, ben helped me with the Olin stuff and because I was running stock suspension previously. And then uh, even just uh, tire setup and, and pressures was way off. So uh, he helped me with that. And then I think just the combination of being older and more experienced, having time to reflect and slow down a little bit. Um, and then again, working with Ben and his, uh, his coaching, if you will, um, those three things, I think the racing school, Ben, 
and the, the setup issues combined just uh, worked well for me in 2020. Okay, that's awesome. I didn't know you'd uh, gone over to Europe to Catalonia and uh, had taken that uh, Troy Cursor, Cursor School. Uh, Stuart, I think we may have another question or two for, uh, for Jordan. Yeah, the question we have is uh, which model BMW are you going to be racing? Is it the current generation or the pre-2019-2020 bike? Oh, so it's uh, 2020. Um, really, when I went over to that racing school in Europe, uh, again, like they were running the new bikes and to be able to hop on one of those, it, it mind you, like Catalonia being a GP circuit, it's a little different than our, our Canadian circuits, but uh, it, it was uh, just a phenomenal bike and it, it kind of sold me on that. Um, and the, the fact when I saw Michael Leon running stock electronics and uh, podiuming at Calabogi, that was kind of the last piece of the puzzle where I thought, oh, okay, so I don't have to buy this uh, complicated kit ECU and the stock electronics are quite capable, which, you know, I had experienced in Catalonia, but it was kind of an unknown to me whether once you build a bike into race trim, how, how they still work. And um, that proved to me that they, they worked well. So I was able to get a 2020 uh, late in 2020 and uh, it's, it's working well so far. Jordan, how, uh, how did you get into the uh, financial uh, advisor role in addition to being an electrician and which, which one of those two careers are you following right now in addition to your uh, road racing career? Um, okay, well, I guess I'll start at the beginning again, uh, back when I was 18 uh, or even 17, I thought uh, I would go into the trades. Uh, I picked electrical as uh, my preferred trade after doing a, a co-op with, with uh, lots of different trades. And um, so I basically did that for uh, seven or eight years and then sort of was um, introduced to the IBEW and uh, ended up joining them for the final three years of my career. That was probably one of the, the best decisions I've made, um, both professionally and, and otherwise. And then my, basically, it's a family business uh, being financial advisors. It's my mother who's uh, started her, the business. And we were talking about what it might look like for me to join her in that business. Um, at the time, I was a foreman at uh, the New Oakville Hospital. And, you know, I was really happy doing electrical. It was great. But uh, work got a little bit slower. I had an opportunity to take a vacation. I thought, okay, here's 18 months of discussion with my mother about what it might look like for me to join her and uh, eventually take over the business. So uh, up during that vacation, I went and uh, went to see what it was like and immediately thought, you know what, I think I can do this. This is for me. And uh, basically came back from the vacation and told my uh, general foreman at the time, you know, it's nice, nice working with you. I'm going to go pursue this other career. And, uh, and so I did, um, started sort of from scratch at the bottom in a, a new career and started working and started training, learning and, uh, taking all the courses I need to, to, uh, get my certification. So now let's see, five and a half years later, um, got, I've been doing, I've been working in finance. Uh, I'm still, a you know, very proud IBW member, but electricals somewhat in the past for me and uh, moving forward with finance. Okay. Would a financial advisor uh, tell a young man to uh, go spend some money on some motorcycles and buy a <laughs> bunch of tires and go pay for a license and an entry fee? Um, how, do you, how do you justify it from a, uh, a financial <laughs> advisor perspective? So I would look at it a couple different ways. Um, when I look at my road racing versus, you know, riding motocross that I used to and some of the dirt bike stuff, 
the risk reward is a lot better for road racing. I found myself with a lot less broken bones. I'm at the hospital a lot less. So uh, from that perspective, road racing looks good. Um, as far as the financial element, you know, I find the, the memories and the experiences are, are priceless. Uh, it's really hard to quantify their value. And so I find myself at the track pretty well uh, as much as I can, or even just uh, training, if you will, just riding with my friends in the off season. Um, Cause it, it is just so much fun. So it, it's kind of a balancing act, really. I try and try and minimize the risk and maximize the reward and, and roadway racing allows me to do that a lot more than, uh, than motocross does. Yep. I've got a couple of questions I want to ask you about your competition number plate and who were the uh, pro riders that were your heroes uh, when you were just getting into it as an amateur. But Stuart, I think we've got uh, some more uh, stuff in the Q&A. I do, Pat. And uh, I'm just going to take a, a moment here. I'll just read it because it's coming from Nathan Naslin. And Nathan was on with us. So he comes on with us pretty regularly, but he was on with Chris Ellis as featured guests back in December. And I'm just gonna read what he wrote. Uh, and he's just saying, thank you to us for having uh, he and Chris on track announcers notebook back in December. With all this COVID crap, it's been difficult to see friends face to face and the lack of any bike shows this year has really taken away any opportunity for us as an industry long timers to gather and bench race like we typically do at the shows. That opportunity to chat with Chris and share stories during that evening has suddenly become an even more cherished event. I recall how both of us were saying we had just scratched the surface and could do a part two. We will, have, we will now have to hear more of those part two stories from friends and family. I know there will be many. Godspeed, Chris. Thank you, Nathan, for, uh, for those words. Again, uh, if you have joined us a little bit late and uh, have not heard as yet, uh, motorcycling and motorcycle racing, and many of us on the track announcer's notebook tonight lost uh, a great friend and a great person uh, in Chris Ellis, who passed away earlier today. Our condolences go out to his wife, Christine, his family, and his many, many friends. And when I say that, I mean, friends uh, around uh, around the world in different countries who he touched uh, during his lifetime. Um, if you've got uh, a comment, uh, please make use of the Q&A. And if you've got a question for uh, CSBK Superbike uh, rookie, Jordan Royds uh, is with us. We've got another uh, 20 minutes or so. Jordan, as, uh, as an amateur Superbike racer, who were the pro riders that you uh, looked up to? And I would assume the other Jordan, who's got 14 Superbike championships, might be among those riders. Uh, you got it, Pat. I think my first time watching a Superbike National was at Mossport in 2015. So um, a lot of the guys that I watched and, and looked at were, I'll be racing on the same track with this year. So um, guys like Zoak and uh, Ben Young and Matt McBride and Claudio Cordy when he was here, um, those were the guys that I was looking to in the, the super bike class. And I mean, most of them are still racing, uh, Hornblower and Tommy and Mitch Card in the sport bike class. Like I was watching as a guy who had never been on a racetrack, um, just as a, a fan looking up to these guys. So it's, it's kind of uh, surreal to be in the position I am now where in I'm ending up racing some of them or um, talking to them and, and getting bike set up tips and pointers from them. Um, it, it's been, been a fast journey to get here that's uh yeah it, it's been it's been strange um as far as other racers that i looked to up to a lot of it was uh ama supercross and motocross guys so uh james stewart who's definitely a big fan of him and uh the ryan dungies and ryan Villapotos. um 
definitely watch them a whole lot. And actually that's, that's kind of where my number for this year came from. Uh, I'm pretty sure now I have number five reserved at uh, CSBK pro six GP and soar um, basically across the series that I plan to run. So that's kind of, uh, kind of after Dungey, if you will. Um, as I was a fan of him, I'm just, uh, debating on whether or not I put it on my KTM or, or not, uh, the bike I use for my dirt bike training, if you will. Okay. And then, um, as an amateur, I think you were running three thirty-seven last year. How did that number, uh, come about or, or was that just what was available at SOAR and at the super series? Right. So, uh, I guess back to James Stewart, I, I wanted to get uh, number two, five, nine, which was his, uh, amateur number and it was taken. So I kind of tried every variant of that, whether it was, um, j just anything close to that. And, uh, I couldn't get that. I think even for my pro number, uh, Jeff Williams has number seven. So that, um, that kind of left me picking number five, but three, three, seven. Uh, yeah, there's no real significance there. I just uh, picked whatever was, whatever three digit number was available. And then once I had uh, the opportunity to, you know, drop a, a digit or two, there was single digit numbers available. And I thought, you know what, that's the easiest to put on my bike and easiest to read. So let's, why not take one of those? Have you had much conversation with other uh, BMW riders in the series, such as Michael Leon? And uh, incidentally, we will have Michael on Track Announcer's Notebook next Monday night, along with uh, Ben Young and Trevor Daly, as we'll be uh, trying to talk to as many of the CSBK Superbike riders leading up to the uh, start of the season in early June at, uh, at Calabogie. So, we hope you can join us next Monday night as we uh, chat with Ben Young, Michael Leon, and Trevor Daly. How, uh, how generous have they been with information or suggestions, uh, Jordan? Um, they've been great. So uh, actually, indirectly, um, I was talking to Michael Leon about some setup stuff uh, Sunday, I think, through, uh, I'm not sure what his title is, I think crew chief, um, Kyle uh, Blakely. Um, so, and Michael, I've, I've messaged before in the past and he's helped me and, uh, even just helped me in before I had my hands on the BMW to figure things out. So that's been really beneficial. Uh, Ivan Babich as well has been super, super helpful. Even when I'm racing him at Shannonville, loaning me parts, spare parts that he had to bolt on my bike to help improve my bike, uh, before we go race each other. So, uh, and Jeff Williams as well. I was able to talk to a Cal Bogey a little bit um, as far as BMW specific stuff. So that's been really, really helpful. Um, and then other pros in the paddock, uh, Steven Nickerson and Keith Nickerson and Will Hornblower have been helpful, just general bike setup, bike conditions, riding pointer. So um, yeah, it's, it's been uh, quite surprising how, how helpful they are knowing, you know, we're all competing against each other. Uh, indeed. Uh, Stuart, I think we've got something else in the Q&A. We do, Pat. Uh, we've got a question for Jordan, and that is, um, can you tell us about your double up ride with Troy Corser? <laughs> I skipped over that part. Um, yeah, so that's... That's actually part of the whole racing school Europe experience that I've highly recommended to a lot of racers here in the paddock. Um, it's not something I would, you know, I went there for or knew about or would typically have done, but so many of the people in um, that were doing the school that had done it before just spoke so highly of it. And uh, it was a pretty incredible experience. Of course, like I mentioned, earlier, it's not every day I get to spend time with the next world champion. And he's a little crazy on a bike to say the least. So we're like every straightaway, not even the straightaways, just exiting every corner. He's wheeling with me on the back. Um, he's backing it into corners. Uh, it was, um, 
yeah, if, if anyone gets a chance to go over and do a, a school at Racing School Europe with Troy, it's worth uh, whatever it is, whatever he's charging, it's worth it to go hop on the back with him and uh, get that thrill. Like we're so used to being in control ourselves. And then when you, they, they do put a handle for you on the gas tank. So you do have something solid to hold on to. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's quite thrilling. Like if I go to another school, uh, which I may at some point, um, I'll, I'll probably take the opportunity to, to do that again. The other thing I will mention coincidentally, Racing School Europe films those uh, with their 360 camera and the one they posted on their YouTube page of Catalonia is me. So you can actually turn the screen around and look and, and see my helmet and my gloves. And um, it, yeah, it was quite a thrill. Was a thrill how scary was that? And what's the price tag to get scared like that by Troy Corser? Oh, uh, I think it was like 30 or 40 euros. And um, so the first three or four corners, like genuinely going into them, I th I'm hanging on for dear life thinking, oh, he overcooked it. Oh, he misjudged. We're going to crash. We're going to crash. We're going to crash. And oh, oh, okay, we're fine. And then straightens it up again. And then going into turn three, it's like, oh, no, he overshot again. We're going to crash. We're gonna oh, 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 okay. No, we're good. And uh, yeah, it, then, then I kind of understood, wow, okay, you can break this late. You can break with this much lean angle. Um, like he, he's doing this in full traffic with all the school as well. And he's passing people uh, doing it. So it was quite impressive. It, interesting as well. None of the brake markers or um, none of the brake markers changed, uh, which I found fascinating. So he would accelerate out of the corner, you know, wheelie down the back to the front straight away, the whole thing. And then uh, even with all the extra weight, he used the same marker, but because we didn't have that extra speed with the, the extra person on the back, it, it all worked. So the lines, the markers, the turn in points, all of that was uh, pretty much the same. It was, it was a ton of fun, Pat. If you're over there and Troy's around, um, they've got leathers you can you can borrow too. Well, I'll let Stuart go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, what have you been doing uh, preparing physically and mentally for that giant leap from amateur to pro this year in the in the off season? Um, so nothing too much different. Um, I actually have done a, a, a little bit more riding this year. Um, I, I pretty much just continued on my dirt bike off-road riding in the woods throughout uh, October, November, December, January. I got some studs for February uh, after a couple of frozen days and uh, a lot of lack of traction. So I was able to run those again in the woods, no, no ice racing. Um, so running in the woods and then the studs just came off, let's see, early March, I think. So I've had four or five rides with them off and a couple top off-road Ontario pros have joined us. And uh, so it's always fun to chase them. I haven't been able to keep up to them in uh, several years. And uh, I think I'm actually riding probably the best I've ever ridden off-road. Just my comfort on the bike is there. Um, I was able to keep up to them better than in previous years. With gyms being closed and then open and the, require, the special requirements there, I've, I've stayed away. Um, I do have a, a somewhat of a home gym here and a rowing machine that uh, I haven't quite got to yet. I haven't quite gotten to yet. But uh, I hope to, as we approach the season a little bit more, mostly it's just been riding. The other thing that's been a little different this season, uh, I was pursuing my certified financial planner certification, so my CFP. And that's a pretty extensive course um, that for me was condensed down because of the, the timelines and trying to get it done before racing season rather than uh, try to do it and write an exam in October, sort of do it through racing season. The, the exam's only written twice a year. So I was able to get 
all of that done, uh, I have the exam coming up. Unfortunately, it's about two days before the SOAR race. But uh, for the most part, that's out of the way now. Uh, I'm trying to go dirt biking as much as I can and, and ride with ride with faster guys. Actually, a couple of guys that were on the track announcers notebook with me, Chris Pletch and Nathan Playford, uh, have been coming out a lot. So we've been able to, uh, to push each other and uh, just have a lot of fun. It's great being around the guys from the track again. And you can just reminiscing about last year. It's uh, a lot of fun. We all had some pretty good years. Yeah, well, we hope to have uh, uh, Pletch and Playford on uh, before we get into the season. We want to follow up on uh, the SOAR series a little bit closer to their uh, opening round. Uh, are both of those guys moving up to pros like you uh, are? Uh, I can't speak for them. Uh, I mean, Chris, Chris is pro. Um, I think Nathan's going to be racing some uh, pro star motorcycles. So I think he'll be alongside me with Ben. And uh, I, I mean, I think he's only had three or four race weekends. So yeah, I, can't really I think see. he'll, he'll probably stay, uh, stay amateur, but I was quite impressed uh, at, uh, at SOAR watching him ride, particularly in the wet. So uh, I, I followed him out one session and uh, I was, I was quite impressed too. And he's so. a, an ex uh, off-road uh, rider. Uh, recently, I've been voicing over the 2019 because there wasn't a corduroy enduro last year, some incredible footage. And as much uh, as I've got respect for guys uh, on super bikes and what they can do on the pavement, some of these off-road riders are incredibly talented. Any thoughts? And I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, an off-road event like the uh, corduroy enduro. I'm actually one of the landowners for the corduroy enduro. Oh, so the, okay. the devil's staircase is at the back of uh, our family property there. Oh, okay. So yeah. you, you've got a good connection. That would be a local race for you. Uh, sort of, sort of. It's a hundred acres of bush that we have that the, the end of the Blackberry test runs through. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I do know Blair Sharpless and uh, Steve Brand that, that cut some of the trails and that are heavily involved with that. Um, my All my off-road friends keep bugging me to do some races. So if they're in the off season, uh, maybe I also had uh, a friend of mine talking to me about some flat track stuff and he's got some pretty fast Hondas uh, that he builds, uh, Kurt Beeger. So I'd, I'd like to try and uh, get out there and play with those too. Um, it's kind of a full plate with CSBK and just with the other sports being, I would say more risk and more danger to me. I'm going to try and avoid them during the season. Even now, as we're starting to approach the CSBK season, I'll maybe try and slow down on the, the dirt bike and the, and the trails. Like there's a whole lot of trees there that I, I'd really like to avoid hitting. And when you're trying to push to keep up to these like top guys that are running the corduroy and Dural, it's uh, it's difficult. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, Stuart, have we got anything else in the, uh, in the Q and a? No, Pat, there's no question in the Q and a, but I, I did have a question for Jordan. I guess it goes with, along with, uh, doing the, the different disciplines of motorcycle riding. I've been seeing, noticing a lot of other guys in social media as well. It seems like there's a real trend guys doing, I mean, they've always ice raced and so forth, but there just seems to be more of it and getting more competitive with it. So I'm just curious as to how that help sharpen your skills, uh, taking it to road racing, going from off-roading to the pavement. Yeah. Well, I think, um, I think that was one of the things that helped me as soon as I started on track, all the fundamentals from the dirt, um, be it, you know, a body position, eye movement, clutch control, throttle control, like the shifting, all of that stuff was kind of automatic. Um, so I, I really just had to focus on learning the lines and the tires and uh, the different characteristics, even instinctually just uh, doing certain things like panic braking. Um, uh, definitely the fundamentals transfer over. And then for me, I mean, obviously being in Canada and well, stuck here, thanks to COVID, um, we can't really, like, I, I can't go on a racetrack and train right now. So uh, that's the closest thing I have to it. And uh, I just really enjoy it. I, I think it does sharpen the mind and, and definitely keeps me fit riding, uh, riding these, these sandy whooped out trails that I'm on uh, constantly. 
Yeah, no doubt. Just staying oh, active for sure. Yeah, it works. It works well for me. Well, uh, uh, Jordan, final question. Once the CSBK uh, season is over, and that's going to wrap up in uh, August, unless the schedule changes somehow. Any thoughts, uh, assuming the border is open, to maybe catching uh, one of the Moto America races in uh, in September? Hmm. Um, I don't really think that's in the cards this year. Uh, it would be nice to go down there at some point. It, it really depends how, I guess, competitive I am or how I'm feeling. I, I think the budget is a little bit higher to go run one of those races from my, my very limited understanding. So that's uh, not, not a great incentive. Um, I have been trying to get down there to do our, our annual trip to West Virginia on the dirt bikes. Uh, that's been postponed a couple of times. Um, I've been trying to get down there to do the Yamaha champions riding school as well, which has been postponed a, a few times. So I'll eventually get down there and ride. If I could do the, do like the YCRS and then do a Moto America round at that track, I think that would be beneficial but to try and go down there and learn a track and then race it in a weekend, I, I think is a pretty tall order. So maybe something for the following year or, or the future, but really if I could learn the track first and then go, I think that would be the smart way to do it. Well, Jordan, I want to thank you for coming on all the best with that uh, financial advisor certification exam that comes up just before the opener at, uh, at SOAR. Uh, we wish you all the best in your rookie season in uh, CSBK. Stuart? Yeah, thanks, Pat. Just want to thank Jordan and everyone for joining us this evening. Again, our thoughts and prayers are with Chris Ellis and his family and all of his friends in the motorcycle community. He's going to certainly be missed. And uh, please uh, follow us on YouTube, uh, Track Announcers Notebook. Subscribe to the channel. You'll be notified every time we upload a new video. And again, next week's show, we've got action pack with Ben, I think it, Ben Young, Trevor Daly, and Michael Leon. So uh, it's things are heating up as we get closer to the motorcycle season, and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, that Thanks might. So much. Thanks so much hey, for Jordan. having me, Pat and Stuart. Great. Thanks, Jordan. So that's going to wrap up this edition of, uh, of Track Announcer's Notebook. I'll echo what uh, Stuart said uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, Canadian motorcycling and motorcycle racing have lost a great man and a great friend in uh, Chris Ellis. He will uh, be remembered uh, as uh, just a great uh, motorcyclist, but also a great human being. Have a good week, everyone. Happy Easter. Stay away from too many of those chocolate Easter eggs. And we'll see you back here on Easter Monday night for the uh, Monday April 5th edition of Track Announcers Notebook. Be well. Thank you, Jordan. Thanks, Thanks Stuart. Good job, Pat. Thanks. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.